Tonight, our first topic, my name is Justin McDaniel. I am the extension educator here in McLean County. And I will be talking to you about personal protective equipment. So we will uh, we'll get started. Uh, very important part of, of pesticide application is personal protective equipment. So uh, the risk, the reason we use work clothing, personal protective equipment is to protect ourselves. And we protect ourselves from the risk of acute pesticide poisoning. And acute meaning immediate due to an, an exposure to a pesticide. And then the, also the health effects from a long-term exposure where maybe we're having a, a sub-lethal dose, but then that, that dose will over time build up. So we're wearing personal protective equipment to, to protect us against those. And then we, we do this because the label on ag pesticides that refer to EPA's worker protector standards require that certain items of PPE must be worn when handling these, these types of pesticides. So if you are a worker that is handling these pesticides, then you have to, to wear those, those minimal amount of personal protective equipment. So our eyes, the, the exposure to pesticide can occur through, as we talked about last week, the eyes, the nose, the mouth, and the skin. So we, we do know that all formulations, liquid, powder, granular, can all be absorbed in clothing thereby thereby becoming a path to exposure. We know that some of the, the liquids, the powders, some of those can be more capable of spreading to us. So we have to be more careful with those. But all formulations that we talked about last week, all can be absorbed in the clothing. And once they're absorbed, they can, can lead to a direct path to the skin. So look on, where do we find what we use for our pesticide label? For our personal protective equipment, we, use, we read on the pesticide label. And in that precautionary statement, that explains the type of personal protective equipment the, the art and work clothing that is needed. And there's typically a minimal amount, like in this one, long sleeve shirt, long pants, waterproof gloves, chemical resistant footwear wear plus socks, protective eyewear, chemical resistant apron when cleaning equipment, mixing or loading. That is the amount of personal protective equipment that you must have on hand and have on your person when you are using these pesticides. Once the, it, it goes on to even say that we discard this clothing and other absorbent material that's been drenched or heavily contaminated. So if it does come in direct contact with a large amount of the, of the mixed chemical or the, or the concentrate, once that happens, we wanna discard that clothing, not try to clean it up and wear it again because the chances that we'll get that all out become very slim. And then we, we run the higher risk of exposure than we did before. So this is the, uh, this is the, the minimum. When, when it gives us that, we can wear more than that, but that's the minimum. Work clothing, the, our typical clothing that we wanna wear on a day-to-day -day basis when we're, when we're spraying is a long sleeve shirt and long pants. Uh, and then our underclothes, you know, briefs, t-shirt, socks and shoes, uh, closed toed shoes, uh, and then a hat with a brim. Those are good uh, work clothes, long sleeve shirts. And I know a lot of people say, well, 
when we're spraying it's hot and I don't want to wear all of that when it's hot outside. So we we want to try to to reduce that exposure of our skin as much as possible and long sleeve shirts provide the most coverage for our dermal layer for our skin that we can get and so a long sleeve shirt is is probably the best it may be hot but it's going to do the best job long pants same same thing much better than than a pair of shorts because we're trying to cover that as much of our skin as we can same thing with 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 shoes socks and shoes um Socks are great, but if we don't wear good shoes, shoes with holes in them, things like that, and, and our socks get soaked with chemical, socks are doing us very little good. And a hat, a hat's going to help protect our forehead and all of our scalp and all that skin uh, on, on top of the fact that it's going to help protect us from the sun. We know that as we talked about last week, there are three signal words that go into how, how dangerous a chemical is, how the toxicity of that chemical, and the more toxic the pesticide, the more of our personal protective equipment that we're gonna to need to wear. So starting over to the right of this, of this slide that you're looking at, we see the danger. Danger means that, that this is uh, many times accompanied with the skull and crossbone symbol, but danger is the most toxic of the, of the three signal words that we have. And that tells us that this, that this uh, chemical could take less than a, than a teaspoon to, to be lethal for a human being. Could be a taste up to a teaspoon. So if we're dealing with a chemical that is that toxic, uh, we're, we're looking at using things like the coveralls, overworking clothing so that we, we have our work clothes, but we're covering those up with an additional layer. We're also using chemical resistant gloves and footwear, and then using respiratory and eye protection so that we're not breathing that in and there's not a chance for accidental contact into our eyes. So all of those things, in addition to our, our, our basic workwear, that'd be our long sleeve shirt, our long pants, socks, shoes, and our, and our hat. So as we move on to, to our middle category, the warning category, that may just be uh, coveralls, overwork clothes, uh, shoes and socks, chemical resistant gloves, and eyewear. And then as we move to our least toxic category, it may just be the regular work clothes, the long sleeve shirt, the long pants, shoes, socks, and then the addition of, of maybe some waterproof gloves just to, to reduce that chemical onto our hands during mixing or loading or, or spray. So we're not nearly as concerned about that. We're, we've left off uh, eye protection. We've left off, you know, respir respirators, things like that. So we still know that, that those chemicals can be harmful, but we're not nearly as concerned about them. When we say rubber gloves, rubber gloves are not all alike. The, uh, the, the, the disposable nitrile, the nitrile, the neoprene, the disposable barrier laminate, all of those are, are different in their protection ability. Uh, probably the most difference in those is, is the durability of the material that they're made out of, how, how durable they are, the, least resistant to being torn or are developing a hole in them somewhere to allow a chemical through them. So they're, they're heavier as we get into some of those 
higher end gloves. They're going to be made out of heavier material so that they are much more durable and much more capable of standing up to to a chemical you know exposure so that we don't have to worry about that most of those like the disposable nitrile that is exactly what they are they're a one-time use once we come to the end of that use we're going to discard them and we're going to put on a new pair where some of these others may have the the liners in them that we can replace them and we can keep using them over and over again and and get more use out of those before we have to purchase a new pair of them. Glove materials, they differ in, in resistance to pesticide. And if you would like to see how they differ in that, there is a EPA website that is listed there on the uh, on the slide. Uh, the pesticide label shows the letter A through H that corresponds to the right glove material for that pesticide. So, so if you want to know what kind of gloves you need, you should be able to read the label, and they should tell you the right kind of glove material for for that pesticide that you're you're using so that you don't experience a failure from the glove once you start using them they should go ahead and and work if you if you match them up right use gloves without lining because liners tend to hold material if they get soaked also, lined gloves get hot, makes your hands start sweating. They're gonna become uncomfortable. You're gonna to wanna to get them off uh, and they're not gonna work as nearly as effectively. So gloves without lining are your, are your option. What size glove do you, do you wear? I, I never knew this, but until this, but you can, Take a tape like a tailor's tape and wrap it around your hand like you see there on the slide. And based on the, the measurement of stop the video of your hand, of your hand, you That's can, pretty cool. you, can uh, you can tell what size glove you need to, to be purchasing so that they're gonna fit. Now, all manufacturers, they may or may not be real true to that, but if you measure that around your hand, you can see you're gonna get a seven to eight, a seven to eight inch measurement around your hand is a small, up to a 10 to 12 would be an extra large. Now, I don't know if Brad Gunner's on here, but they probably don't have your size listed here, Brad, because I've seen your hands and and you're probably that's probably won't cover yours. So, but but we uh, that's a pretty good ratio for most people. So we, that's a good place to start, and then you may want to go try them on, depending on the manufacturer of the gloves that you're using, to make sure that that's pretty close, but. You can see where they're measuring it at and, and the method that they're using to, to measure it at. Use disposable gloves for short tasks, something that you're just gonna use real quick and then you can throw them away. You don't have to worry about trying to keep them, clean them up or, or reuse them. Disposable gloves are thinner. And so since they are thinner, they're not able to be adequately cleaned and can't be reused. Typically, disposable gloves are, are cheap, cheaper, and they're made out of typically cheaper material, but they're still going to hold up to, to a simple job, a small job. Uh, the 
The two types are the barrier, lam barrier laminates and the nitrile gloves. So there are, those are some examples of gloves that you're, you're going to not want to get to attach to. You're going to use them and then we're going to dispose of those pretty quickly. So if you do get some gloves like the gloves that you're seeing here in the, in the picture, these are reusable gloves. And if we, if we do spend the money to purchase some of those reusable gloves, we can wash those with soap and water and rinse them. And we wanna make sure we get them clean before we take them off our hands. We don't want to take them off and then start trying to clean them with our bare hands. We, we clean the gloves with them on. And maybe you need somebody to help you. This person's trying to pour the water and wash the gloves at the same time, which we all know that, that uh, there's a couple of things wrong with, with what's happening here. One, he's trying to hold a a container of water and he's trying to pour it onto his own gloves and that's probably we don't know if he's contaminating the, the container that he's holding and where's that water that he's rinsing off his gloves where's it going it looks like it's going right out into his yard or it may be the people that he's working for his yard whatever it may be uh, so be be conscientious of those things because that chemical that you're rinsing off your gloves can still be very active and, and make sure that you know that the target that it's going down on, even though you're just rinsing those gloves off. Use coveralls when required by the label. Uh, coveralls like these that are pictured here can be reused. They're typically a cotton twill. You can still find some of these. Uh, they are going to be hot, but, but they, they are very effective to, to get the job done. If you, if you just have a short job and, and you don't need them again, there are some disposable or limited use coveralls. Uh, Tyvek is, is probably one that, that most people recognize, uh, Pro Shield Clean Guard, are also some of the manufacturers of some of those, those disposable coverall options for someone that might be looking to, to just have a pair of these on hand just in case they're needed, something to maybe keep in your in your work box just in case the right the need is to arise and you you just need them for a short period of time. And when you're done with them, you can dispose of them. You don't have to worry about trying to get them cleaned and, and how you're gonna reuse them again. So these are some, some very good options for, for disposable coveralls. For other, for, uh, for other information about the disposable coveralls, they are limited use. They're not meant to be reused day after day after day. If you're going to do that, then you need to, to pick something that is made to be more durable. The, the time that these are kind of made to be worn is about eight hours. So if you're going to, if, if you exceed that eight hours, it may be time to, to either switch to a new pair of coveralls or or to, to go and invest in a, in a more durable pair. And once they are, once you take them off, they are, they are just discarded. And uh, when you decide to quit, when you decide today's that you've had enough for today, you take them off and you, uh, you discard them using the same rule you would for containers. You just you just rinse them off, and you dispose of them just like you would a a rinsed out container. Aprons are good. 
aprons have a place when, especially when, when we're when we're mixing and loading pesticides. Uh, aprons are made to do some of our heavy lifting, and as far as protection goes, they're they're made to protect us against large quantities of, of a concentrate many times when we're in the mixing and loading phase. That's when we're going to have the opportunity to come into contact with more of our concentrate, concentrated material. And so we, we want to make sure that we do everything we can to, to be safe wearing these, these coveralls at that time. Because we know that that when we're mixing this chemical, that's when accidents can happen. That's when spills happen. They are made out of very durable material, same materials, gloves and coveralls. And they, they are made, typically, if you buy the right aprons, they're made out of material that can be rinsed off and reused. But that is going to protect the, the big majority of the, of the front of your body and and protect your work clothes and your coveralls in case there is a splash. And that chemical as it's splashing hits the front of those coveralls or the, that apron and saves your coveralls, saves your clothes, saves everything else like that. Eye protection. Eye protection is very important. You know, they, they say that we we only get two pair, we only get two eyes. And that's, that's all we get. And it's up to us to protect those because if we, if we lose our eyesight, we've, we've lost a, a big valuable resource to us that no one wants to have to deal with that. Uh, maybe even, maybe we don't lose our eyesight, we get reduced eyesight because of chemical splash. Just little splashes over time, all of those things. Uh, start to have a, a uh, an impact. You want to check the label to make sure and and get a if it if you do need a pair of glasses, make sure you have a pair and that they're somewhere where you can find them. They're good and clean. Um, this is something we probably want to keep them dedicated to. You don't want to have to go out to your to your work shop and get the pair of glasses that you got hanging on your cutting torch and, and bring those and use those or and try to keep them back and forth or or even try the same tricks that we try with our cutting torch where we squint our eyes down real close so that we think we're protecting them, you know, and think, well, that's just as good as eye protection because we we're not. We want to make sure that they have a good fit, that they fit good to our face, because if they're not fitting close to our face, then they're not protecting our eyes. If a chemical can get between those glasses and our face, it can get in our eyes. If you wear corrective lenses, corrective glasses, make sure that those safety glasses fit over those. You don't want to have to remove your, your, your seeing glasses, reading glasses, to wear your protective glasses and then not be able to read the labels or, or read the measuring equipment or, or anything like that. We want to make sure that, that the glasses, eye protection that we get have uh, protection above and to the sides of our eyes for any kind of spill that might come in from above or from the side, as well as most of them protect from what comes up from below. But the more protection they offer, the better job they're going to do, the better job they're going to provide for us. If you need a respirator, they are typically required with some of our more dangerous pesticides, especially something that, that has a, in the formulation of a dust or a granule that might have a powder or a dust that's going to travel pretty freely in the air and, and at a pretty high rate. 
if we do need a, a respirator, check for the specific type of respirator required. Uh, we see a lot of these respirators, the one there on the, the left, the dust or single use one, we see a lot of these that people have been wearing the last couple of years. And we, we know that that's one of the options that you have. Those are dust masks that we typically refer to them, but these are single use masks. These are not things that we want to try to, to reuse on, on multiple occasions. Then we move into the cartridge mask where we can change the cartridges out on them and continue to reuse them in multiple scenarios and, and at multiple times. If we do need a cartridge respirator, uh, get one that is professionally fitted. And if you have, have facial hair, then you're going to have probably going to have problems wearing a a uh, respirator can't be worn over a beard with goggles and so they're, they're made to fit better than that they've got what would be a half face respirators or full face respirators depending on the style you buy but buy one that is fit to your face so that you you get one that that does a good job and it and it is effective. You don't want to have a job, one that, that does not provide you with the safety that you need because it was poorly fitted. Headgear, headgear protects you, protects you from exposure to pesticide. We know your, your forehead and that dermal area along your scalp is very sensitive to pesticides because there's a, an extreme amount of blood flow through your through your through your scalp and so that carries that and absorbs that chemical very quickly and carries it very rapidly uh, it also helps protect you from the sun so not only are you getting pesticide protection but you're getting sun protection as well few pesticide labels require headgear if you do need one that does require headgear, maybe it's a hood that's attached to disposable coveralls, something that like a, a rain hood. Maybe it's a hat with a brim. Uh, maybe it's chemical resistant hood. Something depending on the type of chemical that you're dealing with and how, how dangerous toxic do you feel like it is. Alternatives, uh, the baseball cap that you see the red X through, the reason for that is it has the mesh on it. That mesh on that baseball cap is going to allow that, that chemical to just pass right through it. Uh, so we're probably going to want to look for some type of headgear that, that is a step above a baseball cap. Something that has a stiff, sturdy brim that fits securely. Uh, tightly woven straw hats. Uh, solar weave makes a, a kind of a line brim or cowboy style hat. Or some of the more, what I call the beekeeper hats or, or the hard brim hats. Something like that will, will help to, to stop a little bit of that they're probably not going to provide you with the adequate i mean if we're dealing with a dangerous chemical something that is highly toxic i don't think any of these are are a very good fit for those we're talking about more of the cautious chemicals that are they're relatively non-toxic You know, we don't want to feel like the stormtroopers where we're just wearing so much PPE that that we can't can't move, we can't function, we can't, you know, can't breathe, we can't turn, twist, you know. And so it's just something that we want to make sure that we are protected because 
it is our health. And not only is it our health, but if we get covered in a chemical and we take it home to our families, it, it may be the health of our families too. So our health is nothing to take for granted. And many times we think, well, I'm, I'm just overdoing all this. I look silly. I feel silly. But you'd much rather be, be healthy and safe at the end of this than you would be uh, because no one's going to feel silly about it if you're sick and, and it's caused you to, to lose your health. No one's going to be making fun of you then. Following safety guidelines, at the end of the day, how do we uh, clean up and dispose of personal protective equipment? If it's something that is reusable, how do we clean it? If it's not reusable, how do we dispose of it? Have, have a station where we clean that, that that's what it is designed for. If at all possible, have a station where you can use water, soap, and towel to clean that PPE. So if we have uh, gloves that are starting to, to wear, uh, pesticide contaminated PPE, we wanna make sure that we render those things unusable. They should be cut so that they, can, they can't be recycled, discarded, as you would a pesticide container so that, so that we know that they are being taken care of. Store pesticide contaminated work closing carefully before cleanup. Uh, we don't wanna put this in the same hamper that we put our family's laundry in. The use of, of trash bags or Ziploc bags or any container that is going to keep those those uh, soiled contaminated work clothes we're talking about something that has been maybe we had a spill and we get soaked you know our jeans get soaked our shirt gets soaked with this chemical uh, we're going to want to make sure we treat that a little different than we do just our regular spray clothes when we get home, we're going to want to bag those up so that they don't get put in, in with our kids clothes or wife's clothes, whatever it may be. To launder work clothing and, and reusable PPE, we want to treat them like, like we would if they still got the chemical on them, wear, wear gloves. And we're not going to wash them with our family's clothes, wash daily. And this is not something we want to continue to wear on multiple days because we're just adding that any kind of chemical that gets put on them is just going to be additional the next day and, and the next day and how many days we, you know, we have that. So it's possible after, after they've been contaminated, if we, if we do have a, a point in our day that we are exposed to a, a huge amount of chemical, we want to take care of that immediately. That's not something we're going to want to keep wearing those clothes until the day's over. And then we'll, we'll clean them up tonight. You want to get those clothes off of you as soon as possible. And then have a plan on how to store those on your work truck if you have to. You have additional clothes with you. You put those in a trash bag or whatever it may be. You tie it up. You put it back on the truck, whatever it may be, and you're, you know, at least you're, you're not wearing those same clothes all day. Pre-rinse and pre-soak, get rid of as much of that chemical, and then before we even put them in the washing machine, before, so we don't have to worry about that. If we're going to try to maximize the amount of pesticide removal, don't just stuff that washer full, give that, give those clothes that are in there plenty adequate room to get plenty of exposure to the, to the water and the soap, use hot water 
and use a high water level. Don't try to save water here. Try to make sure you get as much so that we, we have a, as much opportunity as we can to dilute, to dilute that chemical and get it out. Use the regular wash cycle. Uh, we wanna make sure we give that an extended period of time to wash, not a short cycle, and use heavy duty liquid detergent so that we have as much opportunity to, to render that, that pesticide out of, that, out of those clothes and get them clo clean enough so that we can uh, get them back on, get them dried and ready for the next day of work. What are some of the things we can do optional to, to laundering our clothes? We can use fabric softener, all of those things, bleach, ammonia, fabric softener, neither help nor hinder pesticide removal. But starch added to the final rinse may stiffen the clothes when dry, and it, it may allow that extra layer of protection to help remove that pesticide in the next wash. So maybe bleach, ammonia, all those other things doesn't help, but just a little bit of, of liquid uh, starch may help to, uh, to uh, take care of that. Might not want to put it in, your, in there where your underclothes are, but that'll sure help with your coveralls and things like that. Uh, line dry, if, if possible, or use high heat setting on your dryer. Uh, when, we get, when we get our clothes run through there, um, once you have run your work clothes through, you want to run a, a complete cycle with detergent and no clothes before you run any of your family's clothes through there to, to uh, remove pesticide residue from another wash. If you're washing a lot of these clothes, a lot of people may just elect to have a, a separate washing machine that is just for their work clothes and then a washing machine for their family's clothes just because it, it saves having to worry about cross-contaminating your family's laundry with your, with your work clothes. Uh, things you don't wanna do, you don't wanna put chemical resistant gloves in your washer or dryer. It's not gonna do a good job cleaning them and the dryer is not gonna be good for them. Uh, don't wash headgear or caps if you're, for your work in the dishwasher that you're gonna to use to wash your, your family's cookware and, and all of those things. That's just gonna be a place for that to harbor that pesticide and potentially be a problem later on down the road. Uh, the, the best thing you can do is reduce your exposure to pesticides and, and be ready for emergencies. So, if we have an emergency, we call 911 uh, poison control and we can have those numbers close by. If we have our labels, you know, if we, if we need all those things, it's better to have all of those when we need them and never need them as to need to have those numbers quickly and not be able to find them. And then have a good variety of PPE equipment close at hand, whatever, whatever your vehicle that you're working out of, you want to make sure you have plenty of appropriate PPE with you so that if you need to change or you need to, to make an adjustment to it, that you have all that with you and you don't have to go and re, revamp and restart over. Uh, just a little bit, we'll touch on emergency response. Uh, if you are exposed to a pesticide, we talked about last week, toxicity and exposure creates the hazard. How hazardous is a chemical? Well, it depends on how toxic it is and how long we're exposed to it. So a chemical doesn't have to be real toxic if we're exposed to it for a long period of time, but a very toxic Pesticide, we don't have to be exposed to it very long before it's hazardous. So it takes both of those 
to to deem how hazardous it is, but all chemicals have a, a varying degree of of hazard to us, and, and a lot of that may be how how you know sensitive some people are to a certain chemical chemicals that may not bother one person may may be very troublesome to someone else they have a sensitivity to it whatever it may be so some people are allergic to certain chemicals and so things that may not bother most people they may have a sensitivity to them so hazard is the risk of of harmful effect from a pesticide. So the hazard depends on both the toxicity and the exposure you receive in any situation. And, and so being aware of that, we, we know that all pesticides run some form of risk. The types of exposure is, the first one is oral, and that's when we swallow a pesticide. It's either splashed in our mouth or it gets in our mouth while we're spraying, mixing or loading. Uh, maybe we touch something while we're eating with our hands and we put it in our mouth and it we get the pesticide that way. Inhalation, that's where we're going to breathe it in. So that's a dust or that's a vapor that that is out there in the air and we're as it's drifting by as we're breathing it in. Ocular is where the pesticide gets in your eyes. And then dermal is where the pesticide gets on your skin. And we know that dermal is probably the most common form of exposure because our body is covered with skin. And so that entry point is probably the largest that we have and the most most common route of exposure that we see for most people. Now, some of these others, the ocular could can lead to to larger to to smaller amounts of chemical leading to larger problems. If a little bit, if one drop gets splashed on your hand, it may be different. One drop gets splashed in your eye, that may be a whole different story. So, just because your eyes are small doesn't mean that they can't cause big problems come in contact with, with some pesticide. Um, toxicity. So how toxic something is, depends on the type and amount of active ingredient. So what kind of active ingredient is it? And then different, different products have different varying amounts of an active ingredient. Uh, the, I think the example we talked about last week was glyphosate. You, you have uh, glyphosate in some of those products and it, they come in varying amounts. Maybe it's 46%, 48%, 53%, 41%, whatever it may be, but they're all the same active ingredient. But typically as we, as we see larger amounts of the active ingredient, the more toxic they become. But what is the carrier? or the solvent that is in it, that those carriers can be, can, can cause some problems as well. <clears throat> the inert ingredients, uh, what, is, what makes that up? And then the type of formulation. This can be a big problem because if it's a dust, it travels very easy, granule powder, you know, all of those things have the ability to travel very easily in the air. And then if, that that route that increases our amount for exposure. Time times of harmful effects. The acute effects are the effects that we get here and now. So if we're exposed to the chemical, we're going to see those effects within just maybe a few minutes up to a few hours. Delayed effects could be effects that we see that happen years after exposure to these chemicals. We get, we get subpar doses of these chemicals day after day after day after day. We don't see any effects acutely, but it's having an effect on organs in our body or, or things like that. And then the third thing is the allergic effect where people that 
have effects to different types of, of active ingredients that that the general public probably would not have, but they are they have a sensitivity to it and and so it has an effect on them. How to, how to avoid any harmful effects from pesticides, we want to use the recommended personal protective equipment and follow those label directions. The, the closer we stay to that label, the, the safer we're going to be because that label was designed to keep us safe. And if it's used correctly, we're going, we're, we should be safe. The environment around us should be safe and we should be effective with it. And then be, a, be aware of signs and symptoms of harmful effects. And if you start to, to feel something's not right, stop. You know, get away from it. Don't just keep working through that until, until you become extremely sick. You know, some of the signs that you're going to see, maybe on the outside, you're going to see some, maybe it's red, maybe it becomes blistered. Maybe it's a burn. We start to have some swelling, um, you know, in the areas of our eyes, nose, mouth, throat. We start seeing some, you know, doesn't feel right. Internally, maybe we start having some nausea. We start to vomit. Maybe some diarrhea, or stomach cramps. Maybe it's a, a headache. We we, are, we start feeling that foggy feeling. Things don't feel right thirsty, maybe it's chest pains or, or muscle cramps, things like that. And those are all symptoms, of, could be symptoms of many things. But if we're dealing with chemicals at that point, that's definitely something to consider. And if you, if you start receiving some of these symptoms, that's the time to step away. And, and, you know, at least begin to monitor your, your, vital signs, monitor your health, and make that decision whether you need to, to take medical, you know, care. First aid, the best first aid in, in pesticide emergencies is to, to stop the source, source of exposure as quickly as possible. Uh, if, you, if you're not feeling good, that don't wait, call for emergency help. You know, most medical professionals will tell you with most things, there is what they call the golden hour. And if people take precautions within that first hour of something, their chances of survival go way up rather than just trying to, to, to push it away, just, just tough it out, see what's going to happen, and, and then they allow themselves to get sicker and sicker and sicker and they lose valuable critical time. And so if you think that you are experiencing a medical problem due to a pesticide, you know, get, get medical attention quickly, have that label of that pesticide available. If you're going to be dealing with first responders or EMTs so that they know what they're dealing with and what the treatment protocols are, uh, take that, have that label with you, take it with you where, as, as far as they'll let you go because you never know when they may need it. And if you have it with you, that's the reason that we keep those labels handy because at this point is not the time that you won't be trying to pull that label up and get it printed off when you're dealing with a stressful situation like this. That's, this is not, would not be the good time. You know, we're, we're not dealing with this now, but we've just came out of a time when, when heat stress could be a big problem. We're spraying, we're wearing long sleeve shirts, long pants, closed toed shoes, hats, gloves. We've got most of our skin covered up. We're wearing coveralls on top of that. Uh, heat stress can be a big problem. That, that is, uh, you know, we're not allowing our body to cool very efficiently because we've got it covered up and our body becomes subjected to more heat than it can cope with. And that's when we begin to start seeing signs of heat stress. Uh, heat stress is not necessarily a, an exposure to pesticide, though it may cause some of the same 
medical symptoms that pesticide exposure would cause. It may cause us to have blurred vision, uh, rapid pulse, uh, profuse sweating, uh, tremors, all kinds of things that could be related to pesticide you know, exposure. But we know that a lot of this personal protective equipment can, can increase the risk of heat stress, so being aware of that. If we do start having a, an employee or ourself that is, that is beginning to succumb to heat stress, get them to, to a shaded area, cool, cool area, uh, begin to get them some cool water, try to cool them down, and then try to get that protective equipment off as, as soon as possible and as carefully as possible and as safely as possible. Um, have some water there for them to drink. And then if you feel like you need to call for professional help. That's, um, that's kind of the part that we have prepared for PPE. Um, I don't see anything. If anybody has any questions, um, you can uh, type them in the chat or you can ask them. Without, if we don't have any questions, we're going to uh, take a short break, and we will uh, we'll pull up the next slide. So, you guys want to take about a five minute break and, and step away. We'll we'll get reloaded up here with with the transportation and storage talk. And Josh, he'll be presenting that to you. Loading pesticides. You want to always thoroughly inspect all containers. Accept pesticides only if labels are legible and securely attached to the containers. It is a federal law that all pesticides must contain a label. The label's a law. You've heard me say that on several um, classes. The label's the law. That's what all uh, Department of Ags are going to resort back to when checking you. So always be sure the labels are attached to the jugs and are legible. Check all caps and plugs, tighten them if necessary. A lot of you guys may use drums. Make sure those, those lids are tight. Um, same way on you know, smaller containers, make sure those caps are tight. If they have foil seals when they're new, make sure they're good. Do not accept any containers where it appears leakage has occurred. Handle the safe, uh, the containers uh, carefully, secure them properly. Um, Remember that very hot or cold temperatures can reduce the efficacy of the pesticide and can damage the container as well. Uh, sun exposure does the same thing, breaks down that plastic, makes them brittle. People ask me if herbicides have a shelf life. I tell them the herbicide usually outlasts the jugs that they come in. You should always be familiar with the labels of the pesticides. We went over that last week. You will, the ones you'll be transporting, uh, you should be familiar with if you're applying them anyway. Pack the appropriate PPE as Justin talked about. Every label lists the PPE minimum requirement that you need. So be prepared for that in case of a spill or leak or possible exposure. Keep hazardous material spill kits in your vehicle at all times. That should be at the top of everybody's uh, list of things to be concerned about. We, uh, as Red River, we're, our safety team requires us to keep a spill kit in, our, in every vehicle that delivers herbicide. Carry your protective clothing and equipment in the passenger compartment of your vehicle. You don't want it rolling around in your toolboxes, uh, being, being exposed to those herbicides. 
uh, wear and tear deterioration of your PPE is, is not a good thing. Lock your vehicle, never leave pesticides unattended. There's several reasons for that. One, uh, you don't want your herbicide falling into the hands of a child or someone who doesn't know the danger of it. Not to mention these things are getting more expensive every day. You need to, you need to keep your eyes on them. Uh, make sure they're locked up. <clears throat> You're legally responsible if people are accidentally poisoned from pesticides left unattended. Drive safely, take the safest route. In case of an accident, typically both the vehicle owner and operator are responsible for and must deal with the consequences. If you wreck and spill it, most of you guys are owner operators, so you're gonna be responsible for the price tag that goes with that and an environmental cleanup probably isn't the cheapest thing out there. Proper storage of pesticides protects people, animals, and the environment. Some of these lovely pictures here to show the three things we wanna protect. It also prevents damage, oops, sorry. Proper storage places also prevents damage to the pesticide in its container, protects against theft, vandalism, and unauthorized use. Most places you go, excuse me, I rolled that too soon. Most places you uh, see pesticides will have pesticide storage area. I believe that's a Department of Ag Regulation. The storage area has to have, uh, must display a sign that says pesticide storage area. Always read and follow the label before purchasing the product. Make sure you can meet the minimum requirements for safe storage. Look for statements under storage and disposal. Note or general instructions, every label has storage or most have storage requirements. I would say all label statements, most mostly general store in a cool dry area, keep out of reach of children, give you emergency numbers, give you um, the temperature span of what it needs to be kept at. Um, I don't know that I've saw seen any humidity restrictions, um, but obviously some some contain that and allow for state and local laws to be stricter. Some places you might uh, go into. I know some of the city and municipal or the city and county places that I go to, they require you know their their storage area to be out by itself. Um, elevated, can't be near any drains, must have a curbing inside. Uh, we'll get to some more of that later on in the talk. Um, my slideshow is just a little bit older than uh, it should be because there's no longer material safety data sheets. They're just a safety data sheet um, available at uh, herbicide dealers are online. Most all products um, have one online. There's several places you can go online to get it. Our website has an online place to get SDS and labels, Green Book. Um, there's, there's several different places to get data sheets and labels. On these, they list physical and chemical properties. They identify hazards and first aid. They provide additional handling and storage information. Choosing a, choosing a location, consult with local fire marshals for codes and regulations, locate, in an area where flooding is unlikely, maintain a 50 to 100 foot distance from wells, surface, 
water and downwind from animal feeding stations and dwellings. I know where our warehouse is. Once a year, the fire department comes out, does a walkthrough from, for our facility. They identify any new um, products that we may be carrying that we didn't the year before. We keep a record of all the labels and SDS sheets. Um, and they usually update the sticker on the outside of our building that identifies that we have hazardous materials in the building. Storage buildings. There's several op options to explore. High volume of pesticides should be stored in their own facility. Plans are available in print or online if you're looking to build a storage facility. Um, There's several different options that you may want to look at. Uh, each day, they, the, the government uh, mandates more restrictions on what you have to do as far as storing pesticides. Um, like this says, many plans have engineering specs, mixed load areas, storage facility, cleanup facilities. All of this stuff's available online to, to really help you guys. Um, best practices just to buy what you need as you need it. The size of your storage facility depends on your need. Uh, do you need just a small storage shed, portable storage unit, designated area inside of another facility? I see a lot of these when I'm delivering herbicides, small cabinets, you know, you see your flammables are usually stored away from other products in cabinets like this one on the left, or you have a big stand-up cabinet. Notice the padlock there, it's always a, a good idea. Key features of all storage facilities, they prevent unauthorized access. Um, you don't want children, people that aren't familiar with uh, the herbicides or what they can and can't do. Don't want them to have access to those products. Protects the environment. A lot of these facilities, like I said, have curbing inside to protect against spill and outward contamination. Um, and it also maintains appropriate conditions. Temperature keeps it from getting too hot or too cold. You wanna keep it secure, like I said, make sure you have the padlocks or bolt locks. Any gated entrances should be locked as well and limit access to keys. You don't want 50 people having access to your, your herbicide storage. One, they could get in there, damage something that you don't know about. You always have the probability of it disappearing and um, you want to keep your product safe. You're responsible for that product. Security lighting helps deter crime. I don't know how it's getting in your part of the country, but in our part of the country, people are walking off with anything that's not tied down or locked up. Like I said a while ago, most uh, facilities have signs. Um, like here it says authorized personnel only, chemical storage area. You want to post these warning signs at entrances because some people have um, medical issues. They can't be around this stuff, can't breathe it, can't be around it, don't want to be around it. Um, poison storage area. I don't like to say we have poisons. I just like to call them herbicides. Poisons usually scare people. Uh, this one right here is a, a great storage facility. The one on the bottom right, highly visible markings and warnings. Protecting in the, the environment. This is something as good stewards we should do. Uh, we should try to prevent uh, concentrated products from, from escaping our storage facilities. These things are safe and they're labeled rates. 
but we we really need to be good stewards and try to protect the environment. You know, Justin mentioned a while ago, you, you only get one set of eyes. Well, we only get one environment. We really should take care of what we have, not to mention it's job security. Um, floors should be made of non-porous material free from cracks. Um, a lot of these concrete floors nowadays, the people are putting sealers on, things like that to, to prevent uh, product from getting through cracks. It allows for easier cleanup. You have a spill, it's quick and easy to clean it. Here's the barrier I was talking about. Construct floors with two to four inch lips or recess below the level of the doors to contain larger spills. In my warehouse, I had probably eight or nine drains like this one in the floor. When we, uh, when I started, we had to go in there and plug every one of them drains and weld them off. They have a cap that are welded off. You don't want drains going into your sanitary sewer, things like that exposed where that herbicide can get through that. Existing floor drains must be sealed unless they are connected to a tank that can be cleaned out. Outflow must be captured and disposed of as hazardous waste. Non-absorbent shelving material. Um, a lot of people use shelf paper, things like that. Um, you can use that to soak up any product that might potentially leak. Um, Metal shelves can contain a lip to contain spills. Wooden shelves coated with an epoxy or paint or plastic or containment trays and pans. You'll see those as well made out of plastic, things of that nature. All this is is to, to protect spills from getting on the floor. You guys been doing this long enough, you know, lids get loose jugs get knocked over, things like that. This is just a, a precautionary measure. Proper conditions, ventilation and humidity. Um, you see these air vents over here in the pictures to the right that allow your uh, buildings to keep from sweating. Um, proper airflow, venting to the outside. Any of you ever walked in a chemical storage facility that doesn't have a vent on a 110 degree Oklahoma afternoon in August, have that stuff burn your eyes when you open just from the, the jugs, venting, things like that, be swelled up because it's so hot in there. These are always a good idea. You want constant ventilation. It's needed to remove vapors, excess heat and humidity provides safe conditions for workers, extends the shelf life of the pesticides or herbicides, use exhaust fans or passive vents. Um, I haven't seen too many exhaust fans in smaller facilities, uh, but that would be a, a great improvement. Exhaust air directly to the outside and this may be reduced in the winter time. Cooler temperatures, not near as much humidity, things of that nature. Proper conditions and temperature. So it's maintained temps between 40 and 100 degrees. You don't want them to freeze. You don't want them to boil either, I guess. Um, temperatures inside some of these facilities can be really warm. Well, plug it up out there in the paint. Freezing may cause chemical separation and container failure. Access heat may cause explosion or fire. Minimize your fire hazards if you provide heating. Keep your stuff away directly in front of the, the heater. Give yourself a little buffer zone. Keep those products from getting too hot. Consider spark proof electrical fixtures and controls. Um, some of the co-ops I go to, some of the municipal buildings, we will see these, these kind of fixtures in their chemical uh, 
uh, storage facilities. All right, for, see how many of y'all been paying attention if you want to click in on chat. Which one of the following, a little test here, a little quiz, which one of the following here is not an important feature of a storage facility? Is it A, locked entrances, B, ventilation, C, high peaked roof, or D, warning signs? C is the correct answer, high peaked roof. See if we can do another one here. The minimum distance between a storage facility and a well is what? A, 25 feet, B, 50 feet, C, 75 feet, or D, 100 feet. It is B. Practical temperature range to maintain inside a storage facility is A, 40 to 100, B, 60 to 80, C, 30 to 90, or D, 50 to 110. A is correct, 40 to 100 degrees. Okay, if y'all right. go back to me, I'll continue on with a few more. Storage rules. Do not eat, drink, or smoke in a storage facility. If you've come in contact, if you come in contact with any of these products, you go to eat, drink, or smoke in the storage area. Your mm -hmm. some more storage rules are never store pesticides in milk jugs, soft drink bottles, fruit jars, or medicine bottles. If any of y'all have ever been to my in-person meeting in Norman in years past, one of my favorite stories and slides that my boss puts on when he does his talk about pesticide storage and, and safety is not putting any products in other containers. He said he when he was working the forestry side, he uh, walks into this guy's garage and he had seven or eight red gas cans in a line and he had different things stored in them and one of them had a circle and an arrow pointing up and he says um what what is in these deals he goes well look at that jug right there see that circle he said that's round and the arrow up he said that's round up so any of you guys out there i'm sure you've seen it i see this little gas can here in the picture in the bottom right, and it made me think of that. You don't want to store products in, in anything but the original container um, due to safety as well as, you know, you see this Gatorade here, child happens to be in that area by some slim chance. They see that, they, they may want to drink. So do not keep gasoline or other combustibles with pesticides and, and, and do not, uh, ever use a different container other than the original container. Safe storage practices and rules. Use original labeled container. If the container is damaged, transfer to a container suitable for the pesticide. I would caution against this if it's not the original container. Um, it would probably be best to, to go ahead and use that product um, if the product label is damaged or becomes unreadable, you can obtain another label online and I would keep it with that container. Uh, you want the common name, the percentage of active ingredient, the registration numbers, signal words, and the use classification. If you don't have immediate access to that, you can see someone put it on this tag on the bottom right or on this jug at the top. I wouldn't advise that. I, with today's technology, it's just as easy to go online and reprint a label, tape that thing on there, and then you're good to go. I have people all the time come to me and say, hey, can you smell of this? Or can you look at this and, and see if you can identify it? That is not something you wanna do. You don't wanna directly breathe in that stuff from a container. Um, and a lot of these things look exactly the same in that jug. So you wanna make sure you keep those labels on those jugs. Safe storage practices, 
Keep storage area organized and clean of debris. Inspect containers regularly. Keep metal containers and bags off the floor. Metal containers can draw moisture on the floor. They start rusting, things of that nature. Bags get wet, they draw moisture, they get brittle, come apart. Uh, you want to place heavier containers and liquids on lower shelves. There again, that's kind of the common sense. Safe store, some more safe storage practices. If practical, store highly flammable and volatile pesticides separately, like I told earlier in the in the class, those flammable um, cabinets are a great investment for those kind of products. Keep them away from heaters, things like that. Designate a bin or an area for containers prepared for recycling. Um, I don't know. There's very few places that recycle the, the plastic jugs. Um, there are places you can call and get the plastic drums picked up or the totes uh, for recycling. If any of y'all have any of those laying around and you need that, that number, give me a call. We can find you a place that recycles those. Be prepared for mishaps. Accidents do happen. Provide clean water in case of a contact with skin or eyes. I don't know how many of you guys um, have a fresh water um, container on your vehicle other than your spray tank, but it's always a great idea to have those products you know, a, a, a good rinse water, fresh water, things of that nature. It's always great to have that stuff. If running water is not practical, store water in a large container. Keep a first aid kit nearby. Spill cleanup. Always keep a spill kit, uh, absorbent, a broom, shovel, and a container with a lid. Like I said, we keep one on every vehicle that we carry herbicide in. More supplies may be needed for higher storage volumes. If you're carrying a tote around on your back, the back of your truck and it gets a hole in it, a bag of absorbent and a shovel, you're not going to contain that, that kind of <clears throat> spill with, that, with those, with those uh, few little items there. More supplies may be needed for higher volume storages, for, for higher storage volumes. Check your SDS sheets for materials needed to deactivate spills. Here's some more PPE. PPE should be kept nearby, but not in the storage room to prevent contamination. Uh, Justin may have touched briefly on this in his, in his talk. You know, like I said at the beginning of this one, you don't want to keep those things in your toolbox. You don't want to keep them in the cab of your truck or a separate box just for PPE. Maybe needed to respond to spills before in, or before entering a storage area. Plan for emergencies. You need to train your workers on how to respond to spills, fires, and other emergencies. Um, all of our warehouse people are trained uh, how to con contain a spill as soon as it happens. You poke a hole in a tote. Uh, if you drop a, if a pallet bus and two, two and a half gallon jugs hit the floor, we have uh, absorbent ropes we put around them. We have absorbent things of that nature. Need to keep a fire extinguisher that is approved for chemical fires nearby. You can't just pour water on a lot of these, these uh, products. Some of them, the more water you put on them, the more active they become. So you wanna make sure you have a chemical fire extinguisher that's approved for the product that uh, you store in your facility. 
make sure to inspect the fire extinguisher on a regular basis. I know at all of our warehouses, we are required by our safety team to have ours inspected twice a year. Every six months, they come in, check our fire extinguisher, make sure it's in working order and uh, give us a certificate that, they, that they're working properly. National Fire Protection Association sign. This is the sign that I was speaking of that our fire department comes by and uh, updates every year. 704 sign alerts first responders, responders to hazards of storage contents. Check with your local fire department and building code. I know most of you guys are small owner operators or farmers and ranchers. So hopefully you don't store a lot of pesticides but if you do this might not be a um, a bad idea for you pre-fire plan develop emergency response plan with your fire department and buy emergency personnel to the facility like i said we have our fire department come and inspect our facility at least once a year You want to keep records, file, pre-fire plan, and storage inventory, including labeling information. This is probably something most of you do anyway, especially commercial applicators. You're going to have your MSDS sheets um, at your house as well as in your vehicles, um, but maybe a fire plan fits your, fits your operation. Save it more than one location. Like I said, in your truck, at your house, you have all of these things. You're going to be pretty good playing for, for almost anything. <clears throat> the best way to store pesticides. Here's another quiz. A, any empty pesticide container. B, glass bottles. C, any unbreakable wow. container or the original labor labeled container, A, B, C, or D, the original labeled container. Next one, when a pesticide label gets unreadable, A, throw the container away following state regulations for proper disposal, B, write the important information on the container with permanent marker, C, request the pesticide company send you a new product, D, use the pesticide immediately. B is the correct answer. Write the important information on the container with permanent marker. Or, like I said earlier, go online and get the MS or the label and make a copy of it, tape it to that jug. Ways to reduce storage. Track your pesticide usage so that you buy only the amount you need for a season. I mentioned, excuse me, I mentioned this earlier in the talk. Um, the less stuff that you can store on hand, the better off you're probably going to be. Purchase pesticides in returnable, refillable containers. A lot of these products now are becoming in a custom blend or... Uh, refillable, returnable containers. That's a great idea. Um, cuts down on, on storage as well as uh, disposal fees and trash. Return unopened containers to dealer. Um, a lot of places will not take even unopened containers of herbicide back for whatever reason. Um, but a lot of places will not take uh, herbicide back. Write purchase date on all containers and use the first in, first use basis. It helps track your shelf life as well. This is always a smart practice when you have herbicide, although most of them have a longer shelf life. Uh, it's a great practice to go ahead and use the oldest first except delivery shortly before the application. This also helps not only reduce storage, but it also most of the time ensures that you're getting fresh product. 
you don't want something that's set in your building all winter that you forgot about and that may have frozen or may have gotten too hot. It can always uh, affect the efficacy. Key points from all of this is one, you want to choose your location wisely. When you're looking for a storage facility, you want to choose a wise location, one that's not in a flood zone, one that's not near a well, one that's not near a waterway. You want to keep all of these things in mind. Second, you want to keep your storage area secure. You want to make sure those locks are on there. You don't want any young kids or people uh, getting in your storage facility and, and getting a, an exposure or taking your product or some kind of accident happen, happen. Maintain appropriate conditions. Make sure there's ventilation. Make sure it's not going to freeze. Make sure it's not going to get too hot, too humid. You want to store your container safely. There again, we're talking about the heavier products and the liquids on the lower shelf. Keep your metal containers and your bags off the floor. Next, we want you to be prepared for mishaps and emergencies. Have you an eye wash station? Have you fresh water that you can clean up with? Have your spill kits available? All your spill equipment readily available for any kind of accident and recognize your responsibility. It is the responsibility falls on you. All the responsibility for this falls on you. If you have an accident, a spill, it comes down to you as the, the consumer and the applicator to take care of that problem. So realize that this all is your responsibility. At this time, that's all I have. I ran through that a little faster than I probably should have. Um, if you have any questions, you can email myself or Justin.